Hello, my name is Jim Schofield, and my talk is What's the Hardest Thing Timing About Async? I've been working a lot with um, derived asynchronous data, and these are some of my meditations and my thoughts working through how to get that data into components. Uh, a little bit about me, I'm, I live in Minnesota with my wife and five kids and Golden Doodle. And my background is actually teaching. I was a teacher for about eight years. And then about five years ago, I learned how to develop. And I'm new here. Um, I have actually been mostly in Vue and React. And Ember is a strange land for me. Um, like every other framework, there's a lot to get used to. Um, I have come in too kind of pre or post Octane and Glimmer. So everything I deal with has been in that world and I realize there's a long history of other ways to do things in Ember. And there's things like Embroider, Resources, Reactive Properties that we keep hearing about um, that I have to kind of um, <laughs> understand as, as a stranger to this land. So in my company at CrowdStrike, uh, I have recently been working with components that need to be loaded on any page. So, uh, unfor uh, unfortunately, the component has to do all the work of gathering data. Now, that means that I have become really accustomed to using the Fetch API. Now, a lot of people will say, why not just fetch data in the root? And I wish I could, but my compu my components don't have specific roots to rely on and I can't thread data through the root. My components need to be put on any page, any template, and they have to handle data fetching themselves. So when I first came to this task, I thought, oh, it's easy. I know how to deal with that. Um, I've done this so many times in Vue and React. And the answer was to do is do it in life cycles and it all worked. So with all the confidence of a somewhat experienced program I set programmer I set forth to try to create these components and I had a lot of confidence because in the Ember documentation it calls out explicitly what you should do if you want components to do things on first render and they use the kind of canonical example of focusing on an element when a component loads and inside those document those docs, you can see that they point out Ember render modifiers. Now I understand and render modifiers is kind of a way for you to migrate away from old Ember life cycles that have been removed now. So this made sense, but as I read the doc, I came across this statement. We strongly encourage you to take this opportunity to rethink your functionality rather than use these modifiers as a crutch. So, um, I started to think about this. I, in our code base, I see a lot of this where there's a div and there's a did insert hook or modifier where they would call out to do some important API work, maybe calling fetch or, or something like that. And I kept thinking that poor div, that div has no idea that the weight of the world is resting on it even though that that modifier and that hook really don't have anything to do with the element itself. And so maybe the fact that we're placing it in a modifier is not the best place to put it. So <clears throat> here are a few attempts of me iterating on the idea of fetching things asynchronously and providing it to a component. Now, uh, it's not important that we get all the details of what I'm saying here. But I want to kind of show you the pain and the struggle I went through as I went on my path from from very beginning to um, absolute terribleness working with all of these requirements. So uh, here I have my first component, the get dad joke component. It has a, a tracked property with joke and a tracked property to store errors. And you can see in the template, if there's an error, you show the error. If there's a joke, you show the joke. Otherwise, you just kind of show a loading text. Now, this is not robust. This is not something you would want to just do in prod. But this gets the point across for my examples. And then we have this method that's asynchronous, fetch dad joke. Um, 
that will either handle an error or give you a joke. And you'll notice I call this function from the constructor. So when the component is instantiated, it's going to make this call and it's going to eventually provide data through the tracked component. So I have proof here that this does work. Here in this video, you can see that I reload the page. You see loading briefly, and then a dad joke appears on the screen. Cool. Oh, we still have some questions though. Like, will we have to do this work every single time we want to make a request? Um, what if the request needs to change? Let's say maybe an argument is used in the request, and we need to get a specific joke by ID or search term. Uh, what if that argument changes too? Will it react to it? And what happens if that component gets torn down and there's a fetch on root? Um, it's, we should be cleaning up after ourselves. So at about this point, I did start thinking, well, maybe I should use a package. But um, I didn't. So I went on to think, well, maybe I can make a fetch helper. And so here's my attempt number two. I'm trying to kind of make a reusable class that can just be added to components. So this class promise handler houses the value in the error now, and it takes a promise function and in the do fetch method, it, it executes the promise. So now all I have to do in my component is instantiate a promise handler and pass it the the, the fetch function or whatever promise I want it to fetch. And then I have some convenience uh, getters to get the data from the promise handler. So I have proof here that this works. I created a toggle which will toggle this component in and out. And when I toggle it in, it loads and then shows the joke. Cool. So the reason that I put it in a toggle is I was starting to think, well, what if a fetch is on flight? Um, it's better, but can we handle a teardown if the fetch is on root? What if the joke ID changes still? What if it has to be passed an ID and, and react to that ID? And I really feel strongly that we should be cleaning up after ourselves. If we have a fetch going out, we should be able to abort it um, if we need to cancel it. Now, this used to be impossible only a few years ago, but we have really nice things now. We have this thing called an abort controller, and we want to guard against memory leaks. We want to guard against sloppy practice. Just like when we need to tear down and remove event, event handlers, we should be aborting our fetch. So here's the problem, though. This promise handler is a class, a plain class, and it's stored on a component that's going to be destroyed. We have no way to let Emmer know that this class should be torn down. So how does it know when to cancel the fetch? So that leads me to attempt number three. Uh, I made a bespoke fetch helper with destruction support, and that uh, uh, destruction support actually has an API in Ember. So we can see now in our next iteration, uh, in the promise handler, we now have this register destructor up in the constructor. The register destructor is taking the context and the method to run, and it's saying that, hey, if this promise handler ever needs to be destroyed, we should be running this dot destroy. Now that's, uh, that register destructor is from Ember Destroyable. So what's the big deal with this and why do we have this when we actually have other lifecycle methods that could handle this? Well, um, one of the cool things is not only can I register destructors on plain old objects or classes, uh, I could instead just pass in an anonymous function and this would also work. So. Uh, going back to my dad joke component, we also have another API that we need to use here too. It's not enough to register a destructor. That's good, but we have to let Ember know the relationship between my dad, con my get dad joke component, and this promise handler. I need Ember to know that hey, when when you destroy a get dad joke component, 
I want you also to destroy this promise handler because it's a child of the get dad joke component. So we wrap, before we attach it, we wrap it in associate destroyable child. And you can look at the API for this on Ember. It's under at Ember destroyable. Now I have uh, proof that this is working. I had a console log in the destroyer, destroy method. And when I toggle this off and the component leaves, you can see that that method gets run. Now, if I toggle in and out and in and out in the network tab, also, if you could see better here in this video, you would see that the fetch requests that haven't resolved are actually canceled. Great. But what will happen again if arguments change for the component? Are, do we have a reactive promise handler? And the answer is no. We've done a good job of tearing things down. We have a good job of fetching things but it still doesn't react. And so here we move on to attempt number four. So I promise you that uh, although this gets kind of hairy and complicated, there is a payoff. There is an answer that will make our life a lot easier. So bear with me. It is possible with normal Ember APIs. Um, it just, I don't feel so great about it. So. Here's a video to prove that it is indeed doable. Now, in this video, I, I've created a, an input where you can start typing search terms. And you can see that it goes out it searches for that search term and gives me a dad joke. And also, if you leave it empty, it will handle a little error there. And by the way, if you want to see this code, this code is available um, at uh, at my GitHub, Jim Schofield, um, slash emberconf2022, and I'll have that on the last slide of this this um, presentation. Okay, so this is attempt number four. Uh, we have the get dad joke component, and it's getting more complicated, and the implementation is starting to really tie itself to this component, which I do not like. I want something that I can just attach easily, and this is starting to not be that quickly. So first of all, uh, we, instead of just attaching an instance, are creating a getter. This getter will run basically, quote unquote, reactively. So if arguments change, this method, this getter will run every time. And I'm using a decorator called uh, Ember Cache Decorator Polyfill. The link is right there. You can check it out. It's really cool. So basically, when appropriate arguments change, this method is run to get the fetch handler. So the, the thing we need to avoid, though, is reconstructing that promise handler or the fetch handler every single time this is run. We actually want to update it so that we can handle destroying and updating and stopping fetches. So we add this extra layer of a cache. This could have been a private property on the, the get dad joke component, but I just created a cache outside of it. The idea is that if I've already created this resource or this fetch handler, I want to run the update method on it instead of spinning one up. And I pass the arguments to this update method. But if there isn't a, a resource already made, we're going to set it in the cache as a new resource. We're going to actually spin it up. So the idea is that when this component loads, it spins up this resource. And ever after, it's going to actually just call update on this resource. It's not going to um, spin it up again. Now, this is my promise handler. And you can see this is just getting longer. The thing that mainly changed now is that we have this new thing called update. In this method, so again, this update method is called when, whenever there's that, that calling of this resource and, and this thing already exists. So it's kind of like re, uh, resetting the promise handler. We, first of all, we reset the value. We reset the, the error if there is one. We abort any kind of fetch that's happening if it's on root. And at the bottom here, we do the fetch again with a new search term. 
there is a little bit of complication right above there because uh, we have this await promise resolve and that's because in the reactivity system in ember sometimes with asynchronous things you might accidentally be updating a tracked property in the same kind of tracking frame for the reactive properties and ember uh, actually throws an error and says don't do that because that is the source of bugs and so this is one way to keep things synchronous and what was happening here was that the abort controller was actually aborting fetches that shouldn't have been afforded uh, aborted so it's uh it's a ugly looking thing and i'm not happy with it i think it's too tied to the component it's um using apis in the way that they weren't really meant to be used it's really hard to debug and i just don't trust it so i started to go back and think well maybe i should be uh, using a package and that's where i came across the answer of resources now resources are um are planned to be included in ember um they're uh, something that will be with uh included with polaris and it's kind of the answer to this problem of how do we reuse functionality in this sort of way um, we have modifiers which have their own place and there is a thing as a, a, such a thing as effects but those are going to be very very rare so so these cases where we're, we just need some sort of resource outside of our component um this is what ember is going to be answering next now uh, because this is not officially included quite yet we have a lot of people who are implementing these resources and providing it and they are stable but they're also opinions of these creators and so i'm going to show uh, two of these implementations as solutions to your problems today and um, hopefully in the future you'll be able to just pull resources out of ember and use them directly um, so the first implementation is ember could get used to this you might have seen this this repo out out there um, there's a lot of cool things inside of it, but for me, the thing that was really interesting was the resource class. If you look at it, it looks very familiar to what I was trying to do. It has a setup, an update, and a teardown. And if you think back to my uh, promise handler, I had a constructor, an update, and a destroy method. So this maps really nicely to the problem that I'm trying to solve. Here is attempt number five where we use resources and it saves us a lot of time. So we have a promise handler and <clears throat> we still store a tracked value. On setup, we do the promise. The promise, the do promise is basically the same as what we had before. And then we have convenient update and teardowns that let us handle things confidently. Then in the component, we have a lot more separation because we don't have a cached getter we use the decorator at use and we instantiate a new promise handler. Now in this case, uh, because Ember has a concept of positional and named arguments, in this particular implementation, I need to pass named arguments, but that's not too important to, um, to actually using it. Pretty easy to use. And man, after you're trying to spin up my own, things feel a lot a lot better, a lot more stable, a lot more dependable. And there's some cool things that come along with this. So if you use that resource class from Ember could get used to this, you have a built in template helper. This example is uh, used directly uh, with that resource class that I made before. And if you didn't notice that resource class is actually in the helpers directory. And because it's actually also a helper, a helper, you can use it in the template like so. We use a let statement to call dad joke helper and it provides data to us. So in the template, if there's a, if the data is in, you can, prov you can display the joke and you don't need any component class to back this up. Now, another cool thing is there are more implementations of this resource idea. And one that I really like is called Ember Resources. Um, this is written and maintained by uh, Nullvox Populi. And uh, this is an example of using 
uh, Ember Resources tract function. So the philosophy for this package is not necessarily to use a class, but to kind of write a function that will basically be turned into a resource. And in this case, we have something called a tract function. It takes a function and it turns it into basically a tract property. Every time that arguments change, the arguments that are important to this function, it will rerun this function and do the fetch for you in our case. So and you can see that um, in the template, you just have to check, is there a value on this joke resource? And if there is, we can display it. And if you look in Ember resources, there's a lot of things that you can use. There's use function, use helper, use resource. And then at the very end, you might notice there's use task. Because a lot of people are using Ember concur concurrency right now to solve a lot of these problems. And one of the things that I think is really neat is that you can use them in tandem with resources. Maybe someday Ember concurrency, um, because it kind of inspired resources in a way, maybe Ember concurrency is going to be written as a resource. But for now, we can actually um, use them together. So this is using use task, and it is using a task that's been previously previously written. So if you have Ember concurrency and you have tasks in your projects right now, you can actually use a resource um, to, to call it when you need it. So in this case, we do use task, we pass the task in, and we pass uh, that all, we, we instantiate that all into joke task. Now the nice thing about joke task, that on the template, you have these really nice properties like is finished, is error, has started, and those are all from Ember concurrency. So it gives you a little bit of of that those niceties from Ember concurrency, and it reloads when you need it to reload. So hopefully, I've convinced some that uh, resources are going to be really nice. In fact, you can use the idea now with some of these implementations. And it's going to answer a lot, of, um, a lot of questions that people have when they're trying to deal with things, especially like with asynchronous data or reusability in functions. Resources allow for a lot of code reuse. And to me, I compare it to, Ember, uh, I compare it to React's hooks. It's kind of like Ember's hooks. You take some functionality out, and you can kind of use it wherever you need it. It uh, utilizes life cycles in a way that are really easy to work with. And you don't have to spin up kind of your own hack together solutions now that we don't really have the life cycles for components that we used to. It allows for better composition. For example, there, there, is, uh, there was something I was playing with that I didn't include here. But I set up a resource to go fetch a random word. And then I set up a, research, uh, a resource to search for a dad joke using a word. And then I put them on the same component, and they were able to seamlessly work together. The dad joke resource waited until the random word resource got a word, and then used that to do a search for a dad joke. And I think above all, it's just shorter to write. It's a lot easier to write, and there's a lot more convenience just built in for you. So that's all I have. Again, I'm Jim Schofield at jscof on Twitter. I have a website here, jscof.com. And all of these examples that I've gone through are on my GitHub repo. Uh, my GitHub is Jim Schofield of one word, and then this, the repo is emberconf2022. So uh, thanks for coming along on this talk on resources. Uh, also, I, I work at CrowdStrike, and we are hiring. So if you are interested in continuing to work in the Ember world, with us, or if you're interested and want to know more about what we do, um, just let any of uh, let me know, or let anyone in CrowdStrike uh, community know, and we can talk to you about that. So thanks again, and I hope you have a great rest of the conference.